The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chinpowersystems.com to find out more. There's a lot of misinformation out there uh, today, right? It's at the tip of your fingertips on the internet. And so that's something that um, is out there. It's in people's, it's, you know, for better or worse, it's in people's minds. And, you know, couple that with kind of what I just generalizes the fear of the unknown. Uh, if you haven't seen a solar project before, if you aren't familiar with uh, what solar is and what it isn't, your your natural human instinct is to be somewhat fearful uh, of it. And that fear, you know, plays into the misinformation that is out there. Are you speeding the energy transition? Here at the Clean Power Hour, our hosts Tim Montague and John Weaver bring you the best in solar, batteries, and clean technologies every week. Want to go deeper into decarbonization? We do too. We're here to help you understand and command the commercial, residential, and utility solar, wind, and storage industries. So let's get to it. Together we can speed the energy transition. Welcome to a special episode of the Clean Power Hour Live. Today is May 10th, 2023. I'm Tim Montague, your host and creator of the Clean Power Hour. Please check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Today on the Clean Power Hour, Overcoming NIMBYism, Best Practices for Solar Development with Aaron Halimi and Davi Wilson. With their extensive experience in navigating the complex landscape of local stakeholders, regulations, and utilities, Aaron and Davi will share the strategies that have helped their companies successfully implement clean energy infrastructure projects from concept to completion. They make a nice juxtaposition because Apex develops large utility-scale clean energy projects and Renewable Properties is a community solar developer based in California working in a handful of markets where community solar is taking off. I'm going to briefly introduce Davi and Aaron. They will make short introductory comments, five minutes or less, and then we will get into a discussion, including taking questions from our live audience. You can put your questions in the chat or the Q&A. And my guest co-host, Tor Valenza of Unthink Solar, is here to curate your questions. So do think of questions and put them in the chat. Davi Wilson is the past Vice President of Public Affairs for Apex Clean Energy where she built and directed an industry-leading public affairs team focused on preserving and enhancing clean energy's license to operate in state houses and communities across the nation. It was her work at Apex and their enlightened approach to constituent relations that inspired me to invite Apex to this event. Davi was instrumental in formulating Apex's unique and politically savvy approach to community engagement, based in relationships and rooted in a campaign mentality. Aaron Halimi is the president and founder of Renewable Properties in San Francisco. His vision was to create a platform that takes an institutional approach to an underserved and fragmented area of the solar market, small-scale utility and community solar projects, projects ranging from 1 to 20 megawatts in size. As president of Renewable Properties, Aaron has led the development of over 500 megawatts of solar across multiple transactions and project sites throughout the U.S. Before we get into the introductory comments by Davi and Aaron, which I'm just thrilled to have such venerable guests on the show, first some context for our live audience and viewers and listeners. There are over 1,900 gigawatts, 1,900 gigawatts of solar, wind, and battery storage projects in interconnection queues across the U.S. today. The current generating capacity of the U.S. grid is 1,250 gigawatts. So if you think or if you have any doubt that the clean energy transition is happening, please take note. That's not to say that any of this is easy, and that's why I've convened this expert panel. According to Berkeley National Laboratories, the 1,900 gigawatts of projects in interconnection include 947 gigawatts of solar, 300 gigawatts of wind, and 670 gigawatts of battery storage. 
What this means is that financial markets, federal legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA of 2022 as it's known, and private development is raring to go. Landowners are ready, willing, and able to lease their rural properties to developers because it makes good financial sense for their families and businesses. In Illinois, a farmer can triple their income by converting corn and bean fields to solar fields. Lessen the ecological load on the land by improving biodiversity with pollinator prairie plants and reduce runoff, which is killing the Gulf of Mexico, among many other man-made disasters. Keep in mind that fully 40% of the U.S. corn crop is used for corn to ethanol, which is 100 times less energy efficient than making electrons from photons using photovoltaics. And yet, When all is said and done, when we have a 50% solar grid, 40% wind, and 10% other by 2050, if all goes well, we will have just converted 2% of our landscape to clean energy facilities. We are not paving over the breadbasket. We are creating organic farm ground, preserving soil, improving ecosystem services, and creating a a safer, healthier future for humanity. But we can only do this if we can get the permission and cooperation of local communities and lawmakers. Just this week in Texas, there is a major legislative initiative that could literally kill the nation's number one wind market and number two solar market, all in the name of protecting fossil fuel industries and taking away local landowner rights to do as they please with their property. Now to our panel, Davi. Please tell us why this is an important topic and how you have led the team at Apex to build one of the best development strategies in the country. Well, thank you very much. That's a huge compliment. I really appreciate it. It's really nice to be here. And I thought it would be nice to also just recognize all the folks who I see attending today, many of whom are colleagues and friends also in this space who are also very expert at this. So excited for the Q&A that will come uh, after this. So at Apex, I worked at Apex for about 10 and a half years, and during that time really got the opportunity to grow with the company and also grow a team that's really unique uh, in in the company, some of whom are are joining us today on the webinar. Um, The the public engagement team at Apex is is a really unique team in our industry. It's made up of about 25 people now, um, which is a fraction of the number of developers that we have working at the company, but which is the largest team, I believe, in the industry uh, still. And that team is unique because it's really built of folks who have worked in organizing. So mostly from the political space, um, but uh, the lessons that they've learned in that kind of work have really translated well to what we need to do for building support for clean energy projects. So that team um, worked right alongside our development team. They're in all of the communities where we are trying to site projects and get permissions for projects. And their, their focus is really figuring out how to engage with the community in a way that ensures that local voices are there at the meetings where decisions are being made. Uh, Local officials are hearing from people in their own community about why they support the project. Um, And of course, also just providing accurate information so that the community is informed as it makes its decisions. Um, Most folks probably know this, but in most of the US, uh, especially the places where there's a lot of clean energy being cited, a lot of the control over these decisions about whether projects move forward or not, lies in the hands of local planning boards, local zoning committees, and county commissions, largely township commissions in some cases. And that means that these conversations are really, really local um, and typically in very small communities. So there can be a significantly outsized impact from a few individuals in the community advocating for or against a project like this. Um, So the work on the ground feels very much like 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 was said in the intro, building relationships with individual people, helping people in the community learn more about the the project, but also feel motivated to show up and make their voice heard, um, which in many cases is is a is a big ask, uh, especially as these these, these conversations get more controversial and uh, uh, combative in some places. So. Um, so excited to talk more about what we've tried to what we tried to build at Apex, what's what's underway right now, and some of the things that we learned along the way. But maybe that's a good place to turn it back to you, Tim. Great, thank you. And Aaron Halimi, you have worked extensively in one of the toughest and largest solar markets, California, where my colleagues tell me it takes twice as long to get anything done. Uh, what's your success story, and why is this an important topic for you? 
Thanks, Tim. And uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, really excited to engage in the conversation around uh, what really is uh, one of the more important topics, if not the most important topic, uh, when it comes to actually getting renewable energy onto the grid uh, in the United States here today. As you mentioned, uh, my name is Aaron Halemi. I'm the founder and president of Renewable Properties. We are a developer, owner, operator of small-scale utility and community solar projects throughout the country. Uh, as you mentioned, our home state is California. Uh, I've been developing solar projects for about 15 years now. I started developing solar projects in California, have continued to do that throughout my career, and certainly upon uh, starting renewable properties a little over six years ago uh, has always been a focus for us. Um, uh, it is a challenging landscape out there. Uh, it, it is definitely a market that requires uh, a little bit more effort than maybe some other markets across the country. But uh, a lot of markets, while they're different and everything is very much a local decision and you have to navigate uh, uh, a variety of local stakeholders, um, there are lots of similarities across markets as well. And so um, when we're approaching developing a project in California versus approaching a project in New York or Illinois uh, or Minnesota or wherever it may be that we're currently actively developing, uh, we take the same approach, um, and it really starts with uh, understanding that path to permitting and entitlement and really doing uh, the homework and the diligence up front uh, to make sure that you're spending your time and energy as wisely as you possibly can. I mean, you know, one of the, the biggest constraints out there outside of, you know, tackling these local complex permitting challenges when developing solar projects today uh, is the people, right? This is a labor intensive business. Uh, it takes a lot of people uh, to get these projects through the development cycle. And this specific area that we're talking about today, permitting uh, requires a lot of involvement and engagement, and especially if you're gonna do it right, and especially if you're gonna do it successfully. And so, um, you know, that's something that we've prioritized at Renewable Properties is Hey, up front, we're going to take the time to figure it out. And then as the project progresses through its life cycle, we're going to continue to engage as much as we possibly can and be proactive in our engagement as well uh, and, and try to get in front of things that are some of the common, you know, uh, objections or reasons why you have strong NIMBYism in certain communities. So um, that's kind of been our approach to date and happy to dig more into the details here in a bit. But uh, but I guess I'll, I'll stop there. Why don't we first identify what are the objections that neighbors to solar and wind projects are coming up with that developers are wrestling with? And these objections bleed into then objections of other stakeholders like zoning board of appeals members, uh, zoning, zoning board members, county board members. And, you know, one of the things as a solar project developer myself that I'm acutely aware of is that Americans still don't understand clean energy very well. They have started to see it in the landscape in some places, especially in the West and the Southwest and the East. The Midwest is still, you know, mostly a blank slate. We are now getting uh, you know, some some gigawatt scale projects and so and then dozens and dozens of smaller scale projects. And so it is coming into the landscape and wind is no stranger to the Midwest. Of course, we've had large scale wind uh, since the early 2000s. I thought I would work in the wind industry before I worked in solar. There was so much wind happening in in my my backyard, which is central Illinois. But what are the objections that people have to clean energy? Why don't we go to you, Davi? Sure. I think in this, this question is a common question. And I like to right away try to differentiate between some of the things that we hear. So I, I want to differentiate between the things that are true impacts and the things that are not true impacts. Um, when you're in a community having this conversation, it, there is not a lot of differentiation between those two things, those two buckets. And so uh, it gets very confusing. But let me let me try to take it on that way. So in terms of true impacts, I think we should be very honest with ourselves. We are talking about 
you know, converting in many cases, a lot of land that has been farmland into something that is very different in that. And by that, I mean, they're not running a tractor on it anymore and they're not engaging with it the way they used to. It also looks very different. Um, If you're a tenant farmer on a piece of property, it can have an impact on your ability to continue farming on that piece of land. Um, So, so those are, those are real, I think. And, um, you know, aesthetic, aesthetic impacts are something that is is real. So, so those are things that we need to think about. Um, There's a lot of work being done around agrovoltaics and grow, you know, grazing under panels and looking for ways to to sort of maintain ongoing agricultural engagement with the land in addition to panels. That's interesting. Um, But, but I do think that when we're working with communities, that is front of mind for a lot of folks. You know, those are hard questions because in some cases that's about changing the identity of a community in their minds. You know, the wind is the same way. Uh, it's it's not taking up as much land, but you can see those things from a really long way away and people react to that. They, they feel like that's changing their sense of place. Those are real issues. They're, it's not clear exactly how to navigate through them, but we shouldn't deny them. Then there's a handful of issues that I would argue are not real, that concerns about health, concerns about, um, you know, uh, home foundations being disturbed, magnetic fields being dis- disrupted, people not being able to sleep. I mean, this whole slew of things, you know, cancer ca- caused by these. Um, th- many of those are untrue. And th- that information is available online. There's a deep well of disinformation around clean energy projects that it's it's not hard to find once you kind of go down the rabbit hole uh, on social media on this stuff. And there's a network of people out there who are who are really um, sharing information like that. Some of them probably sincerely believe that they're crusading for good <laughs> to save communities from some horrible scourge. Um, and others, I think, are probably less uh, less uh, honest actors, uh, but we see we see that uh, being out there. And so communities end up finding that stuff and, and getting legitimate concerns. And then once once the conversation begins in a community and folks are opposed or concerned and they tap into that from there, it gets real confusing because from a, the perspective of a local official or local community member, I think, you you know, you're trying to figure out who you can trust on this issue. And, and the developer is probably not the first person you trust on, on this issue. Um, but who do you trust? Uh, and in many of the communities where these place, these projects are being developed, there's sort of a, a deficit of trust, you know, as we've seen more broadly in our society um, for many institutions that would traditionally be trusted to help answer these questions. So it's difficult for them to navigate what's true or not true, what's a real impact and what's an uh, a, a not real impact. Um, and so we see community conversations getting really bogged down in both types of concerns and they get all jumbled together and decision makers find it difficult to, 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 to decide how to best protect their communities. Aaron, I wonder in California, you know, where solar started in the nineties is, is lack of awareness of what solar or wind really is a problem still for landowners. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and, and very much uh, so is, I mean, I think, uh, as, as Davi was mentioning, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there uh, today, right? It's at the tip of your fingertips on the internet. And so that's something that um, is out there. It's in people's, it's, you know, for better or worse, it's in people's minds. And, you know, couple that with kind of what I would just generalize as the fear of the unknown. Uh, if you haven't seen a solar project before, if you aren't familiar with uh, what solar is and what it isn't, your your natural human instinct is to be somewhat fearful uh, of it. And that fear, you know, plays into the misinformation that is out there. Um, I think, you know, the other things uh, that we're seeing uh, that still uh, very much occur today, uh, you know, some communities, uh, I would say in California, have a lot of solar uh, development and penetration. And so those communities are familiar with, you know, what solar is and isn't, and they have a very prescriptive process for permitting it. But we have many uh, examples and experiences here at Renewable Properties just over the last uh, handful of years where we've been uh, effectively paving the wave, uh, creating that path for permitting with a local jurisdiction and helping to educate uh, all of the different stakeholders in terms of what are the truths about solar and and what are what are not true about what is not true about solar. Um, and so that that's part of the that's part of the the job. Uh, it's it's about education, really. 
Yeah, it does take a lot of education, and, and and I'm I'm curious how both of you and your companies have pursued, um, you know, a ground game, getting in front of uh, landowners and neighbors of landowners and other stakeholders, be they board members or other influencers. They could be business owners in a community or other people of influence. How do you effectively get them on your side before the disinformation machine gets to them and, and quote unquote, poisons a project? Uh, do, do you have some, some comments about that? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I think uh, coming back to this idea of trust, it's, it's just about trust. Like, like Aaron was saying, there's information, there's so much information available people don't have a hard time finding information. They have a hard time knowing how to interpret that information and which pieces of it they should believe and what they shouldn't believe. I mean, all of us are probably in that same position on many issues. Um, And I think that's why the ground game ends up being so important in places where you can anticipate these kinds of issues are going to emerge because it, it really comes down to at the end of the day, do they trust you? You know, you could provide all of the studies and reports and graphics and information that you want, but if they don't trust you, it it really doesn't matter at all. And the only way to build trust, I think, is to be there and look somebody in the eye, Um, especially in in these communities where it's small, they're small town communities. That's how things operate. Um, And you're already at a disadvantage being from the outside. You know, most cases or developers probably aren't hyper local. Um, and you, 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 you gotta, you gotta go earn that. I think the, the best case scenario is that if you have that trust, you have the opportunity to respond if a concern comes up or to provide more information that somebody might actually listen, you know, look at or review, um, not just with, with an open mind, because otherwise they might think you're just trying to brainwash them. Is it education or is it brainwashing? Um, and I think, um, it's, you asked about being proactive. It feels important to be proactive. Social science research seems to suggest that you can inoculate against disinformation by, you know, notifying people in advance of the things they might hear and helping them you know, think through those before they go out looking for it or before they find it. But, um, but there's, but when it's a developer's word against your neighbor's word, who you trust and know and who, whose kids your kids go to school with and who you went to high school with, you know, that's it's a high bar. So I don't think there's a way to shortcut it other than to be out there and to be developing the kinds of personal relationships where people are willing to give you a little bit of the benefit of the doubt and give you a chance to respond and maybe just believe that you're not a terrible person out there to take advantage of them. And if that's true, then maybe maybe you can actually have some success providing. I mean, the benefits Mm -hmm. of renewable energy projects are many. Uh, There are ecological benefits. There are financial benefits. The tax base of a community will grow uh, when you compare apples of status quo farming or ranching to clean energy. And and yet um, there 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 is this phenomenon, right, of of communities rising up against projects and technologies and sometimes trying to ban them outright, but so I, I, I'm just I'm just curious how you how you guys respond to that, and and what are some specific tactics that have worked for you to um, to be successful? Uh, I'll jump in here. I mean, first of all, uh, this job is not for the faint of heart. Uh, a lot of times I, when interviewing people or when talking with people here internally, you know, ask the question, Hey, do you have, do you have the stomach for this? Um, because, uh, it's a lot, it can be a lot. I've seen it firsthand. I've seen it wear on me. I've seen it wear on my colleagues. Um, you know, this, this is the front lines of fighting climate change and it's not easy. Um, and there are lots of ups and downs, uh, along the way, but you ultimately need to be persistent and stick with it and know that, you know, you're fighting the good fight. Um, In terms of some specific strategies that we've implemented, 
to overcome, uh, you know, let's say a strong amount of community opposition. Uh, you know, one specifically kind of piggybacking on what we were just talking about on that misinformation that's available. You know, we've gone so far as to create, you know, a data room on on a Google Drive and post, you know, studies that are actually, you know, uh, authored by, you know, uh, universities, right, or other uh, news outlets that kind of really break down what's real and what isn't around solar. Um, you know, taking the time to provide uh, community engagement uh, meetings or venues outside of that public process, right, outside of the planning commission hearing, um, because a lot of times people also just want to be heard, uh, right? If they're upset and they, they have an opportunity to get something off of their chest and you as an individual sit there and listen and engage with them, uh, many times that can de-escalate um, the situation and help work towards getting more of that community on board with the project that you're proposing. That's not to say that uh, when you go in front of that planning commission or you know county board of supervisor meeting or city council or zoning board of appeals, whatever it is, that there's there's not going to be opposition because there very well could be uh, at that point in time. You just need to make sure that you know you have your facts straight, and most of the time you're going to uh, because this is relatively a straightforward type of development. While each situation is different and very much localized, we're doing a construction project that is relatively simple and scalable, right? And so the concerns that you get are generally the same and and so how you deal with those can be um, you generally the same as well and so um, those are some things that we've implemented at renewable properties i'd say the other thing that we do going back to your proactive question specifically in california and certainly in some other jurisdictions is when we're submitting our permitting application we will sometimes include studies that go above and beyond what's being asked of us so Specifically, you know, uh, health and safety uh, reports published by universities, coupled with maybe an affidavit from an independent engineer that says, hey, we've, you know, read this study, we understand this study, and we've analyzed this project, and there's no health and safety concerns with this project, right? Like, that in itself can combat a lot of the misinformation that is out there. You know, similarly, in some jurisdictions, you may not have to do a glare study or a glare report. Well, we'll go ahead and do that because glare is also another common concern or misconception that's out there. And so, you know, learning as you, you know, you kind of iterate, right? As you continue to develop these projects, you gain more and more insight into what the specific concerns are. And then that, you know, can help you improve uh, for the next one. And you can get in front of it a little bit on the next one. And so um, those are some of the things that, that we've done at Renewable Properties. I can yeah, understand. Can I pop in with one more thing? Go ahead. Oh. So the, the title of this panel includes the word NIMBY, which many would argue is a sort of offensive term. I think the reason why people are saying that is not because there aren't people saying, don't don't put these in my backyard. In fact, we we literally regularly hear people say that to us. So I don't think that the, the pushback on that term is that that's not an element. I think the reason why there's pushback is because people see that term as dismissive and um, and they want to point out that there are very real things that people are thinking about that that shouldn't be dismissed. And so I've been thinking about what term I'd use instead. I, I think nobody says NIMSI, <laughs> but I've been thinking that maybe that's a, a better term. And people are saying not in my community. And they're not talking about their backyard. I mean, they're not if if they really are just worried about their backyard, they're smart enough not to frame their complaints that way. I mean, mm -hmm. the people are really concerned about, I think, their community. And what what they see as the impact to their community. And Tim, you asked about benefits. These projects do have very significant economic benefits for communities. I mean, in many cases, very significant kind of life changing benefits for communities in terms of their economies, their school districts, their services. But when you're locked in a discussion with a community about their identity, you know who they are, their core values, conversations about money feel cheap. And, and we've had many experiences where there be, there's this, you sort of find yourself in this discussion of, you know, at what cost would I sacrifice the core of my community? And, and when you're involved in those kinds of conversations, it's really challenging to figure out how to build a sense of 
passion and excitement around a project um, when when the economics are, are a little bit sidelined. Um, and so I think a challenge for for us is all to fig- try to keep figuring out, well, let's how do we how do we get into a more honest conversation about you know costs and benefits where we really talk about what's the most critical thing to retain the agricultural heritage of your community is the most critical thing that you don't see wind turbines or you don't have some land now with solar panels on it, or is the most critical thing that you have a functional economy that you know allows farming to continue in this area. It would be really nice, I think, to be having more conversations like that. And it's really difficult, as um, as was said previously, with the current like hearing process, how these processes tend to play out with ordinance creation and permit approvals to, to have those conversations. So I think that's something we can work on. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chintpowersystems.com to find out more. So when you were thinking about proposing a project to a community, there's a lot of work that goes on before you actually get to a a point where you're ready to present something to a community. Is it preferable to do that prior to some official public hearing or or not? Um, 100%. (laughs) <laughs> I would say it's critical to do it before a public hearing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, uh, we talked about being proactive. I think the, 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 the timing question, I think, is always, especially if you're in a place where you expect that some opposition will, will emerge, are you going to have a chance to tell your own story before someone else tells your story for you? And if, if they don't tell your story for you until the hearing, you're, I don't know where you're working <laughs> I don't know what that place is. Most of the time, the conversation about your project is beginning before there's a hearing. And it probably should be because, as we've said, the hearing isn't actually a great place to do, you know, to respond to questions and have good conversations and build trust with people and answer legitimate questions and maybe even change your project a little bit to incorporate some of that feedback. If you're not doing that until you get to the hearing, you know, you've missed that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But I'd also say you were asking about sort of tactics earlier. And I think one of the reasons that we've, you know, Apex built this sort of organizing model is because it's really hard to get people to show up to a hearing. You know, just posting that and then posting the fact that there is a hearing in the newspaper is unlikely to generate a lot of attendance from supporters of the project. It's less, it's more likely to generate a lot of attendance by opponents to the project. So if you, if you want to make sure that there are people in the audience at a hearing that are willing to come speak out in favor of a project, you better have done a lot of work in advance to make sure that they're ready to be there. You've prepared them, you've educated them, they feel good about it. And in in many cases, you know, they're willing to put themselves on the line in their own community in a heated kind of conversation as a supporter of the project. That, That takes a lot of time. So, I mean, that feels critical that you would be doing engagement in advance. So, Apex is well known now for a campaign approach. Tell us what that is. What are the analogies to political campaigning and what are the differences? So what that means to me, um, and and again, like the team that's there is very expert in this. Um, that what that means to me is when we say campaign mindset, I think that means you have, a, you have an eye on the goal at all times. It's what Aaron said. And you're designing a strategy to, to meet that goal. So in our case, often the goal is get the permit or get a decent ordinance that you can actually work under. And that may not be one election day. That may be five election days because you may have to go before a planning commission three times and then a county commission two times. And, and you. so having a campaign mindset means what is the decision that determines my destiny? Who makes that decision? What do they care about? When are they going to make that decision? And then how do I design an approach that's going to make sure that where we can win in that you know moment, um, and I I think um, it's 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 a longer term vision. 
Uh, it's a multi, it uses different strategies depending on what's necessary for the place. Um, but that's, that's what we, I think we, we built the team around. And what, what are the parallels between that and politics? Well, we think that that means you, know, once you know what you're trying to achieve, it takes a lot of similar types of tactics to, to mobilize folks. So that means like, how are you finding potential supporters? And we've worked with some interesting you know, polling processes or uh, modeling modeling strategies in different places to try to figure out who might be supportive that I can go talk to and try to start cultivating them over time into being someone who might actually show up down the road when I need them. Um, that's a, a proactive strategy that comes, you know, very much from the political space. You know, ide- identifying likely supporters and then figuring out how you're going to go. Uh, get them ready to vote. Go get out to get out to vote <laughs> later. Um, so th- those are very similar um, patterns. There's there's a lot of like the the just the brass tacks of organizing are familiar from political space, whether it's a door knocking or direct mail or phone canvassing or you know events, uh, house parties. You know what, what all these kinds of strategies that get used in the political space can also be very effective. Um, in organizing folks to support a clean energy project. So that's some of the ways that we see a parallel there. What about you, Aaron? What, in terms of this campaign approach, where is renewable properties? Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked about it. And when we were talking about, you know, some of the ways in which we can uh, overcome strong opposition, you know, I, I failed to, uh, you know, identify the most obvious one, which is kind of finding your local solar champion and, identifying who it is locally who wants to see this project get done and, you know, working with that person to hopefully expand that universe of people. And so really identifying and engaging and mobilizing these, you know, local advocates at a community level. And, you know, a lot of times that could start with your landowner, right? And in, you know, some instances that might be a local farmer who is ready to retire or farming is not as profitable or stable for them as it once was. And that, you know, doing this solar project means that they can keep the farm in their family that's been in their family for many generations now, or it means that if they put solar on 30 acres over here, that they can continue to farm these uh, other couple hundred acres. I mean, there's all sorts of motivating factors that um, not only are uh, are economically driven, but to the extent that the opposition is around community identity and that community identity being rural agricultural based, like solar actually can help preserve that for some communities, right? I mean, it can it can allow people to continue to 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 do that type of work and. Um, and so we've seen that, uh, and we've also engaged with local universities in many instances, right? Uh, a lot of universities across the country, uh, you know, have, um, you know, maybe their student groups or professors on campus that are, you know, oriented around uh, climate science and, um, you know, engaging with the local university and getting their support and providing opportunities for the students to, you know, maybe learn, uh, you know, what's going on with the project and doing some collaboration there. Um, and and then, you know, obviously there's there's your local constituents. So you may have people uh, uh, at the board of supervisors level that are passionate about fighting climate change or at the city council or the planning commission. And so, you know, really, you know, going out and spending the time to engage with those people. Uh, my company is a lot different than Apex. So we're a team of about 40 people and we are, you know, uh, working in a variety of markets across the country. So smaller, leaner organization. And so, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, community engagement people per se, but we've got permitting managers and project developers. And, you know, we work together as a team and and there's been countless stories, both in California and in New York, where we've, you know, gone to to get a project permitted and, and ultimately faced a lot of opposition. And as a result, had to mobilize internally and create an internal team that's going to, you know, okay, we're going to go engage with this group and that group, and we're going to get in front of them and we're going to try to get them to show up and we're going to get, you know, uh, try to get quoted in the paper and, you know, help fight this misinformation campaign. And, and it very much uh, can be all all encompassing and, and very time consuming. Uh, but at the end, you know, what we've found is is that it works and that it ultimately is what it takes to overcome uh, local opposition. And, and, and you can still get your project permitted. You know, because it is lucrative for the landowner <clears throat> and 
the fact that many landowners are absentee landowners. They might live in a different state. As much as 40% of the real estate in central Illinois is absentee owned. And so those landowners don't necessarily carry the same authority, even though they are major stakeholders, as the guys driving the tractors and the teachers working in the schools and the local AHJ board members, etc. So do either of you have a success story for us where you dealt with this particular uh, challenge, which is, yeah, you need to find champions, right, who are trusted among a swath of community members. Yeah, so that, do, oh, do you want to go first? No, you can go. I've got a good uh, story, though, too, but we'll let you okay. go first. So. Um, yeah, that that is a challenge. Again, I put it with the tenant farmer challenge. Like those are real challenges uh, with, with solar. And I mean, that's an emerging challenge. I think folks are very aware of which landowners are absentee or not in their communities. Uh, but I'd also say that in our experience, the landowners <laughs> themselves, although very natural advocates for, for projects like these, because they signed up, are often very hesitant to be the outspoken advocates for a project because they feel very self-interested. <laughs> um, and again, when you're in the context of a conversation about what's best for the community, and you're the guy who's putting a dollar in your pocket, I think many of those folks feel uncomfortable um, coming out as strong advocates because they worry that they'll be positioned as sort of selfish um, against the interests of the greater community. So you have to look outside anyway. Um, and ideally, you know, we're trying to find good good champions that are not landowner, you know, participating landowners for that reason. A participating landowner is a very good person to tell a story about how they're that's allowing them to keep the farm and the family or how it's going to help them, you know, keep their kids in the community or, you know, talk about private property rights, but, but probably not great messengers on broader community benefits because they, people don't trust them for that in their own community, but people that can be talking about broader community benefits are school superintendents, school boards, um, the folks at emergency services who will be getting funding and fire department or, um, uh, Certainly, um, when we when when Apex is working in communities, it's often doing a, what we call our community grant programs or other kinds of beneficiaries from from investment in the community. Um, labor, in some cases, can be very strong advocates. Can get the jobs that will be created in the community or to build the project. So I think so. This is a little bit of a sidestep for your question, but I think that even if it's not absentee landowners, you still need to be finding these other kinds of voices to support the project and. One successful tactic we have had in a couple places have been getting resolutions passed by local school boards or school districts, just indicating um, what that money would mean for them. They don't always have to say whether they're in support or not, just laying out a, a, an image, a picture of what those millions of dollars translate into in the context of the, the local school district is really, really valuable. So if, if it's, if you can, as a developer, getting that kind of relationship with a, with a school district, say to pass that kind of resolution can, can sort of, I think, address what you're describing. Aaron, you had something. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I was, I was just going to say, you know, obviously if you have a local landowner um, who you know, has weight in the community, that that's a big positive, but that always isn't the case. Right. And, and sometimes you may have a local landowner to Davi's point that doesn't feel comfortable speaking out uh, at all. Um, and then you do have some situations where you have a full absentee landowner who has zero presence in a community. And so they're, they're, they're not there to begin with. Um, we had a situation out here in California in the city of Benicia, where we were developing a large solar project, about five megawatts is big for the the city uh, from the city's perspective. And, um, you know, out of the gates, we, uh, in doing our diligence around a path to permitting and in talking with people in the community, identified that the mayor was a strong advocate for renewable energy. And in fact, was involved with the local utility, the CCA that that this power was going to be supplied to. And so we we very quickly, you know, focused our efforts with her and expanding the the outreach through her and her contacts, as well as identifying other environmentally conscious minded organizations. And now sometimes that's a double edged sword because some 
environment, environmentally minded uh, organizations are against solar and renewable energy uh, for conservation reasons and, and others uh, understand that it's needed to combat climate change. Um, and so, you know, uh, aligning ourselves with the right people, but then also, you know, uh, taking the time to, to ultimately advocate and, you know, in that specific situation was an absentee landowner. There was no, no neighbors. So the sole concern uh, was a visual aesthetic concern and or conservation concern around, you know, taking open space and, and temporarily converting it with renewable energy. And, you know, ultimately it was a, it was a really tough, uh, a tough project for us to navigate and that the local planning commission was really um, persuaded by uh, members of the community that had a tie to the planning commission in terms of you know, uh, we don't we don't want to see solar. And you know, the city of Benicia, if, for those of you that are in the Bay Area, you know there's a large oil refinery uh, right there in the middle of the city. And so this is this is a community that's not um, not familiar with with energy projects. And ultimately, we um, we asked to get denied by the Planning Commission because they kept kicking us out to get you know to be able to appeal it up to the city council where. We believe that there were, um, you know, cooler heads that would understand the merits of the projects and ultimately were successful in getting it permitted. But it was one where had we not identified a local solar champion up front and really uh, worked with that person through the process, uh, we would have been, you know, dead in the water right out of the gate. And that project most likely would not have uh, been what it is today. And, you know, it's out there doing what it needs to be doing, putting renewable energy onto the grid. One of the emergent properties of solar development is dual-use solar. And this can include grazing livestock. It can include growing crops. We have a comment from Joe Scharf here on, in the audience about, you know, what developers are starting to get into agrivoltaics. And um, I will note that Dan French, who's also in the audience has organized a conference called the Solar Farm Summit in Chicago. It was in March of 2023. I think they'll be doing it again. Maybe, Dan, you could post a note in the comments about your 2024 event. But agrivoltaics, I think, is a vital way for engaging at you know rural communities in clean energy because then they can understand that this isn't just going to be an energy project. This is also going to be some kind of a farming or ranching operation. It does have costs and benefits. So I'm curious what both of your opinions are. What do you see happening that you are interested in or excited about? Well, I probably shouldn't speak for Apex since I don't work for them anymore. Um, But I think that while I was there, um, you know, this was a real active question. Uh, I think the reality for many developers, I think, is that they we are they are participating in a very competitive marketplace, which means like if you do something that makes your power more expensive than the next guy's power, you potentially just don't get to build a project at all. And so there's always this pressure to, you know, you never know which investment is going to be the one that makes you uneconomic or uncompetitive with others. You just never know because you, you know that these are long processes. So when you have something new and novel that maybe adds cost, it's it's a it's a little bit of a hard sell um, for for those reasons because they know that if you accidentally overshoot and you make your project too expensive, it won't get built. Um, I would also say that another element that's at play is that operators of I think operators of clean energy facilities are power plant operators. They're not by their nature, very excited about a lot of attention being drawn to, directed towards them. And I think um, as I interacted with operators at our company, they were very much, they were very much more comfortable with no one really knowing they were there, (laughs) which it may seem a little crazy when you're talking about a wind farm or, you know, maybe a really large solar farm, but, but that is more the, the sort of attitude. It's like people know about us if something's going wrong and it would be better if nobody really knows that we're here. Um, So creating you know, the, so they, there's a there's a way of doing business that's comfortable. Any changes to the, that way of business are uncomfortable. It's just it's a it's not it feels like a, that is also a barrier that will get better over time. So I think there, the the conversation is very uh, timely. I think developers are thinking about this. I I think many agree that this could pr- 
provide this, this sort of unlock this new kind of symbiotic relationship with agricultural communities, especially when we're talking about as many acres as we're potentially talking about here. Um, and I hope we keep looking at it. At Apex, they have started some initial work around grazing around in some projects in some places. Um, the, the crops feel like a farther leap that's probably much farther out. And, and those, those are some of the things that we're, we're up against, you know, kind of just attitudes about innovation on, on some of these things, but also um, to the, the real cost impacts and what that can mean for whether your project gets done. So I, you know, a lot of what Davi said is, is, is spot on. I think it's also very specific to large scale utility solar projects, right? And so thinking about it from a community solar project perspective, where in many instances, we're not bidding against others, right? These are uh, programs where the rates are set uh, by the commission or by a local incentive, or, you know, they're tied to some retail or wholesale rate. And, you know, that economic kind of driver is, is, is not as maybe let's say a race to the bottom, right? Uh, so I think there's a little bit more room to play with this dual use concept uh, as it relates to community solar projects than it is, let's say utility scale. And that's even if I'm developing a small scale utility project or if Davi is developing a couple hundred megawatt one, in both instances, those projects are bidding in a competitive RFP, right? Against others to ultimately get that power purchase agreement. And so, Taking that aside for a minute, if you think about it from community solar projects, I mean, there's some states, Massachusetts specifically, that actually has an incentive for dual use, um, you know, solar and, and agricultural use. And you've seen projects get built where there's actual row crops or cranberry bogs happening underneath them. Um, you know, New Jersey has a pilot program coming out, again, incentivizing that. Um, we've yet to really see it from a row crop perspective happen voluntarily. Although I was just speaking to somebody uh, earlier this week that specializes in this line of work. And they were telling me that, that they're working on projects in other areas across the country where there are no incentives for the dual use and, and really as a means to get projects permitted that otherwise wouldn't get permitted. Um, I think where you see mass adoption today uh, is certainly uh, around planting pollinator plant meadows throughout the array. Uh, keeping of honeybees on site, uh, as well as uh, grazing of small livestock. Um, you know, what that means for a developer owner operator, you know, can vary. So uh, while I voluntarily do pollinator plant meadows at a lot of our projects and, and have bees on site and, and even entertain doing grazing, you know, uh, it's a different story when it's a contractual requirement for the 20 to 30 to 35 year useful life of the project, right? And so I have a project in New York right now that's under construction where it's a requirement of the permit to have sheep grazing on site. And that's great and we're doing it. Uh, but me as an owner operator, I get a little concerned. Hey, what happens if the sheep grazer goes away? I got to replace that sheep grazer. Otherwise I'm going to be out of compliance with my permit. That could be a problem. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's, hey, can you make it work economically up front? conversation. And in some markets, it's incentivized and it's happening in other markets, maybe not incentivized, but happening. Like the way you think about it is like level one, level two, level three kind of dual use projects, right? And like level one being pollinator plant meadows, level two, maybe being small livestock and level three being actual row crops. And as you get into the different levels, there's more of an economic impact on the project there's an operational ongoing obligation impact as well. And that's the thing that causes me a little bit more concern is that if I'm participating in a program or I'm getting it written into a permit where it's contractually an obligation for the next 20 years, well, I better be darn sure that the person I'm partnering with on the agricultural side is not going to go away because if they do, that's going to be a problem. And so that's, I think, the other piece to all of this. And so you may see it happen in markets where, you know, there's a lot of sheep grazing already happening, right? Or there's a lot of, you know, farmers doing a certain type of row crop. But those are the things that we think about internally. And we many times uh, are offering up the dual use as a way to get a project permitted and have full intentions on complying with it. Um, and, but it is another time, another, it's another conversation when it's a contractual requirement that if 
you miss, you're, you're, you know, going to trigger some sort of issue with your financing party. I think it checks an important box, which is the trust box of, well, there's going to be farming and ranching going on on this, on this acreage still, you know, that is a common concern of AHJs is taking land out of rotation. They just don't like that fundamental change. Even though we're swimming in real estate in most jurisdictions, okay, 40% of the land in the U.S. is used for grazing of some form, for feeding livestock to feed our, our grocery stores and our mouths, right? It's a huge, huge footprint. Um, and, and so uh, as, the, as the industry evolves, and, and, and a shout-out to ASGA, the American Solar Grazing Association, where when, you're, when your grazier goes away, you can find a new one because they have this database now to matchmake between developers and grazers, right? So that technology is, is flourishing and Lexi Hain, it's no accident, right, that Lexi Hain, the founding director of ASGA, now works for LightSource BP, a major solar developer who now has a dedicated uh, dual-use solar professional at the helm of their operation to oversee dual-use solar for them, which is, which is awesome and, and a sign of things to come, right? If, if you're a developer and you're not into dual-use solar, in five years, you will be. Uh, it's it's uh, you know I th- I th- I do think it's a game changer. I'm biased, okay. I I just happen to think the dual use is a great benefit to uh, the likability. There are other benefits, but the likability of solar uh, wind is no big deal. I mean, it's much easier to graze or do dual use because wind is already dual use, quote unquote. Right, the f- the physical footprint of the towers is so small. Um, yeah, I, I, I got a, a cue from Tor. Thank you, Tor. We should take a few more questions from the audience in our last couple of minutes together. I want to, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Great conversation with Davi and Aaron. Um, let's see here. Well, we've, we've addressed the, we've addressed the agrivoltaics question and, um, I, I don't, I don't know that we can, I don't know that there's a whole lot more to say about that. Dan French did make a comment that there's a project in Colorado, Guzman Energy, which was an 80 megawatt project that was seemingly brought back to life by the developer. Um, uh, you know, after they initially were, were set, were told no, they came back with a proposal to do grazing and that flipped the project. So there's a success story. Um, I'm not seeing anything else here, Tor. But if there are other questions from the audience, that, please put them in the Q&A. The chat isn't working, apparently. Um, that's, an, uh, that's a common problem I have with Zoom. But put them in the Q&A. Tor will put them in, the, in, in front of me, and, and we'll get them answered. So. Yeah, and while, while, we're, while we're waiting, just to, I, I, think I, I think a parallel maybe to some of this agrobaltics um, evolution on, on solar might be the um, – uh, radar lighting systems on wind turbines. So I feel like that was another example of where it, a new kind of concept, a new technology in that case was was envisioned. But that technology had the potential to eliminate a, a really one of those concerns that's real. Like red blinking lights on turbines is annoying <laughs> for people who live near them. I mean, it's Absolutely. not one of the not one of the most attractive parts of these projects. And um, so when an opportunity, when a technology came that could potentially help address that, it was really interesting. But in the beginning, there was, a, there, there was, and actually at this stage still is a lot to learn about how you actually do that. You know, did the FAA actually approve it? And can you even get the pieces to do it? And, you know, how do you build it once you commit to doing it? And many sort of similar adoption implementation questions with this new solution, but it it similarly feels like something that, will ultimately be standard for these projects. Yeah. And uh, it's taking a while, you know, to get there as as the industry learns how to put it in place. Um, but but it, it reminds me a little bit of what you're saying around the agrivoltaics, because I suspect we might see sort of a similar trajectory on that kind of mm-hmm. um, evolution. I feel like we're only scratching the surface here, and, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> are there, for, for, for Aaron and Davi, though, are there are there things you'd like the developer community to be thinking about or uh, otherwise know about that we haven't addressed so far? I mean, the one thing I, and it it was kind of earlier on and I, and I wanted to get a chance to say it is I think 
what's important. I, again, I can only really speak to solar is when we're talking about solar with communities, I think it's important to understand that what we're talking about is a, is a temporary, you know, low impact use. Uh, it's a use that uh, in many instances, almost always requires a decommissioning plan that's then secured by some form of financial security with the local county to decommission that project and restore it back to its original condition, the land. And, you know, Tim, you mentioned about kind of letting agricultural land sit for some years to kind of regenerate and get those nutrients back in the soil. I mean, that that's a real thing. And so, um, you know, it's we're not developing large parking lots. We're not developing large industrial buildings. Uh, you know, these are uh, this is a use that uh, in many instances is misunderstood and, um, and and does require some level of uh, engagement with the community. But it's important for people to to recognize that that ultimately, you know, this is a temporary use and, um, you know, that land could be you know put back into production. Um, you know, right at the end of the, the useful life of that project as well. And so that's something else that that we always talk about and wanted the the, the audience to to hear that also. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that America is largely in denial of what the impacts of industrial ag are, okay? They are, they are many and they are vast. And we are talking about a much lighter footprint, um, much less chemicals, much lower carbon footprint, much better uh, water quality, so soil quality, carbon sequestration, et cetera, et cetera. And um, just to uh, just to let the audience know, Dan French says yes. Solar Farm Summit will be back in 2024 near O'Hare Airport in Rosemont, so you can look forward to that. And we will be posting the recording of this on our channel. Uh, check us out at cleanpowerhour.com. That's where all the audio and video lives. We also have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the channel. The best thing you can do as a listener, as, a, as an audience member, is share this with your friends and tell them about the show, the Clean Power Hour, because we need thousands and thousands of more intelligent, educated, knowledgeable, passionate clean energy professionals and tradespeople to make the clean energy transition possible. This is a team effort. So I want to thank Aaron Halimi of Renewable Properties and Davi Wilson, formerly of Apex Clean Energy, for coming on the show today. Davi, can you say anything about what's in the future for you? Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, well, I'm hoping to work on this local siting issue from outside industry. Uh, it feels like there's a lot of work that can be done out in civil society to help on some of these issues. So that's what I'm hoping to do. And I, I'll grab a little bit of this last slot to just give my last parting remark, which is if you are in the development community, please work on getting resources to do this. As you heard, it takes a lot of resources to do this well. And we are, I would say, as an industry, drastically under supporting this. Apex is happy to work with you on blueprints of what we do or what the team looks like or how or why um, to try to help others get better at this. But it's going to take CEOs at companies understanding how important this is to invest in the people that it will take to do it. And so you know, just encouragement to go get that funding because it, it really can make a difference and it's really important. Well said, well said. Well, I want to be respective of everyone's time. I want to thank you all again for being here. I'm Tim Montague, and as I like to say, let's grow solar and storage. Take care, everyone. The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by CPS America, the maker of North America's number one three-phase string inverter, with over six gigawatts shipped in the U.S. The CPS America product lineup includes three-phase string inverters ranging from 25 to 275 kW. Their flagship inverter, the CPS 250-275, is designed to work with solar plants ranging from 2 megawatts to 2 gigawatts. The 250-275 pairs well with CPS America's exceptional data communication, controls, and energy storage solutions. Go to chintpowersystems.com to find out more.